As we talk about the mechanics of these great expeditions from the beginning of the 20th century, it's important to think about who was doing the work and how the information was being disseminated. So in this section, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Egyptian workmen. So often in the literature, the focus, because these are Western expeditions organized by Westerners, British, French, German, Italian, Americans, the focus is on these individuals, the three or four or five foreigners who come in and run the dig. They're the ones doing the writing. They're the ones disseminating the publications. And so there's been a focus, you might almost say an overfocus, on their achievements. And lost in the sauce, in a way, are the achievements of the Egyptians. Now, they're the ones, of course, doing the work. And maybe many of them are illiterate and they're not writing up publications of the work. But nevertheless, some of them reached tremendously skilled heights and were integral to the success of many of these expeditions. In fact, a tradition was started by Flinders Petrie of going to a place called Kuft and recruiting individuals there who then became so adept in archaeological method that they were always the foreman, the rais of the expedition. And so this tradition expanded far beyond Petrie to the point where everyone wants a gufti to be in charge of the other, perhaps less skilled labor on an expedition. We still do this today. So Kuft is quite famous for delivering archeological talent, native archeological talent. So in the old days, of course, there were 75 men, 100 men, 150 men. It was a lot to organize and to keep them paid and keep the fundraising going. And in this section, I'd just like to highlight a few of these images, and you can see how hard the men are working. And then, of course, what a family atmosphere developed along the way. This is a sort of team photo in the 1930s, and you see George Reisner over on the right. He's smiling, one of the few times he smiles in one of these photos. And standing with them is Mr. Edgel, the Museum of Fine Arts director, who's actually come out to Giza for a visit. So while there might have been 75 or 100, 150 workmen, the group you see here are the core of the expedition. These are the ones handling the accounts, making the decisions, overseeing the men, driving the cars, cooking the meals, taking dictation and helping typing up the manuscripts, solving problems and disputes, lending money, handling funerals, you name it. And in fact, George Reisner came to be a sort of father figure for these individuals. Many of them started with him as boys, grew up in his presence, and in fact had families and children, and the children started to work for the expedition too. So you can imagine what a calamity it was when he finally died in 1942. Many of these people had known no other career, no other employment, and they were, in effect, set adrift. It's time to put names to these faces and to give credit where credit is due. The Egyptians came to revere Reisner, and they looked up to him as a great leader. In fact, uh, some of them even nominated him to be the Khedive in a newspaper article in 1914 that made it all the way back to the Boston Press. That must have been a little embarrassing for George Reisner. But all of this was based, of course, at Harvard Camp, where the red arrow is pointing in this aerial photograph. So this is west of the Khafre Pyramid. This collection of modest mud brick buildings grew over time. And this is where the objects were recorded and processed, photographed. It's where the publications were written. It's where Reisner and his family stayed. And they held court, basically, for many, many decades. Here is the road to Harvard camp with a sign indicating what you're about to see when you drive up to visit the boss. And in this aerial photograph, you can see by the 1930s, it was quite a cluster of buildings. So Reisner trained many of the Egyptians in photographic methods. And so for most of the expedition, it was Egyptians, such as Mohammedani Ibrahim, who was taking the bulk of the images on these glass plate negatives. In the photograph here, you see Mohammed Shadouf, who is actually shooing a little puppy named Patrick Cheops away from the glass plates because they are trying to make printing out paper prints based on sunlight here. So you don't want your dog kicking up sand in the middle of the photographs. The Egyptians were running the photographic studio. And here is Hag Ahmed Yosef, who is an employee of the Egyptian Museum and a master conservator. Reisner enlisted his help to help restore the funeral furniture of Queen Hedda Paris. And in the photograph here, you see Ahmed Yosef making a copy of the curtain box of the Queen after he's already restored the original in New Wood. His handiwork can be seen in the Egyptian Museum Cairo today. And later, Yusuf became quite famous as the man who restored the Khufu boat, discovered in 1954. 
Here again is the aerial view of Harvard Camp, and then in recent years what it looked like semi-restored, sometimes put to use and sometimes not, and now unfortunately demolished once and for all because part of the uh, tourist pathway for an electric train was intended to go right through this area. So Harvard Camp itself is no more. But this is the view standing in that area looking eastwards towards the Khafre and Khufu pyramids and the Nile Valley in the distance. It was a spectacular place to live. When Reisner turned 70, he had a special surprise birthday party and all the men gathered and the workmen and the families and here they are sitting in the courtyard of Harvard Camp handing out presents and taking photographs. This was his family. The men came and congratulated him one by one on reaching the ripe old age of 70 years old. And of course, he wasn't going to slow down. He kept on going. Some of the events are actually quite interesting and amusing. This photograph confused me for a long time from 1938. They're in the courtyard of Harvard Camp. The men have pickaxes. Everyone's laughing. And there's an individual named Mr. Schechter talking to Reisner. Eventually, I realized what this was. It was the dress rehearsal for a live radio broadcast to happen that night. Of course, late at night in Cairo, makes it back live at dinner time in the US, and many, many newspaper articles recorded this event. So Reisner was interviewed, his daughter was interviewed, several other Egyptologists spoke, and in the background, the Egyptians were making the digging songs and digging noises with their pickaxes, and that's what that photograph was. It was a rehearsal for the first ever live radio broadcast via NBC from Cairo around the world. Along the way, a few individuals were particularly valuable to Reisner. Syed Ahmed Syed began as a boy carrying the photographic equipment and stayed with Reisner for decades. Unfortunately, he died suddenly in 1926 during the excavation of the shaft tomb of Hedda Paris. But he left behind some talented family members and two of his sons stepped in, Mohammed Syed and Mahmoud Syed. Mohammed ran the dig for the rest of Reisner's career. Mahmoud learned English and was up at the dig camp taking dictation and helping prepare a lot of the manuscripts. These two first-rate individuals had inherited all the intelligence and the skills of their father, and they were like sons to Reisner. Without him, he would not have been able to run the excavation. I was fortunate enough to meet one of the sons of Muhammad Syed in recent years, and here he is. And uh, he had some of the Arabic diaries that his father and uncle had been recording. And thanks to him, they are now part of our excavation documentation. It was a great privilege to go back in time and hear the stories of someone who knew Reisner and as a boy had played up at Harvard camp and watched all the great discoveries of the expedition unfold.